everyone, I'm Jean Chatsky. Thank you so much for joining me today on Her Money. I have a couple of questions for all of you and just a warning, they are big ones. Have you ever wondered how you'll look back on your life when you're at the end of it? Do you think you'll be happy with the choices that you've made regarding your career, your relationships, and your money? Is there anything you might regret? Look, it can feel pretty impossible to know the answers to these questions right now, but these are the kinds of questions we should be asking when we think about living a fulfilling life. We want to know that we've left the world a little bit better off than it was when we came into it, but sometimes we feel stuck and more and more people are saying they are not happy. They're unhappy, for example, with their jobs. Gallup found 60% of people feel emotionally detached at work. 19% say they are miserable. Inflation is still cutting into our paychecks and credit card balances are at a record high. 65% of people feel that their financial difficulties are piling up so high they can't overcome them. That's according to some research by Discover. And all of this can feel overwhelming. It, it may just seem like there's no room to think about the bigger picture, but what if there was? What if there was a shortcut? What if you could somehow know or at least try to put a finger on your bigger... What if you could somehow know or at least try to put a finger on your biggest regrets now and change your personal life and your financial life for the better. My guest today has heard firsthand from people at the end of their lives about their biggest regrets. Jordan Grummet is a doctor at Journey Care Hospice where he cares for people in their final days and He's taken what he's learned from his patients about life and money and happiness and turned it into a book called Taking Stock, a hospice doctor's advice on financial independence, building wealth, and living a regret-free life. Jordan, so glad to have you here. Jean, I'm so happy to be here with you today. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Yeah, we've all been looking forward to it as well. I I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey to working in hospice care. Um, I, I have to imagine that was not an easy choice. It was not an easy choice, but it was a natural choice. My father died when I was seven years old. He was a doctor like I am. He was an oncologist, which men means he dealt with cancer patients. And when he died, I was seven, and I didn't know how to process that. And there weren't a lot of people in my life who could say, okay, this is what this feels like. This is what you can do. There were few people there to really comfort me other than family and friends who had never really gone through that before. So when I eventually decided to become a doctor like him and went to medical school, one of the first things I did was volunteer in a hospice unit. My first week of medical school, I went up to the hospice unit at Northwestern University and started to volunteer there. And it just felt very natural because I felt like I had this connection to other people going through this. I didn't get to see my father die. I didn't watch the process because, A, I was seven years old, and B, he died very quickly. But by being with other people who were going through that, I felt like I had something to add or I had a connection with them. But just like everything else in life, I didn't really listen to my deeper sense of purpose this is probably what I should have done from a living from the beginning of my medical career. But of course, I eventually moved on from hospice. I did general medicine, and it was only later on in my career where I came back to it and started practicing hospice medicine again. What, what made that happen? I, I mean, I know you were a full-time internal medicine physician. You owned a private practice. You, you walked away from that business. I did. And so interestingly enough, it was actually starting to think about my finances that brought me back to hospice. I got to this point in medicine where I was starting to burn out between the electronic medical records, the issues of compliance, and then just the overall sickness of my patients. I was taking care of nursing home patients. Even though as a general internist, I wasn't a geriatrician, the truth is most of my patients were 70 and older. I was dealing with death and dying all the time. I was starting to really burn out, and I started to look for ways to supplement my income 
because in the back of my brain, I realized that I couldn't do this forever. So I started to think about how can I start making enough money to have a big enough nest egg to either step away from medicine or decrease my time in medicine. And part of that was what I call medical side hustles, right? There are all these things you can do when you have your practice, but there are nursing homes that need medical directors. There's hospices that need medical directors. So I was taking care of an ill and dying patient and I had called the hospice to come see this patient. The hospice nurse came in and said, boy, you know, you put the patient on all the right medications. You've already had all the right conversations with the family. You know, why don't you come work for us? And so I started it almost as a medical side hustle. I would work as a medical director, maybe spend 10 hours a month doing that. I'd get paid a stipend for it. It was a good way for me to earn some income outside of my practice. But it also brought me back to what I started with in medicine, which was volunteering in this inpatient hospice, and reminded me what practicing medicine with purpose really felt like. Because at some point in my career, I didn't feel like what I was doing was as purposeful as when I had started and hospice brought me back to saying, oh, yeah, that's why I went into this field in the first place. In, in writing the book, I know you've talked to many, many patients throughout your career before and after you transitioned to hospice. What, what are the biggest regrets that people have regarding money and, and life? It's funny because what they don't regret is that they don't regret that they didn't make enough money. Like no one comes to me on their deathbed and says, you know, Doc, I really wish my net worth hit that 1.5 million mark because I, I, you know, I got to 1 million. I never got to 1.5. No one says that. No one says I wished I worked more nights or weekends. What people tend to regret are those things that were really important to them that they never had the courage to pursue. And I think that's a big point here. Not what they succeeded or failed at. It was what they didn't have the courage to do. And most of us have these things deep down inside which we've always dreamed about. And for whatever reason, we don't pursue them. Maybe society tells us we shouldn't or that it's a pipe dream. You can't do that. That's not possible. Or maybe we figured the economics weren't there. I need to make a living. I need to support my family. I can't go do this thing I'm really passionate about. I need to do this job that I've been trained to do that's going to pay me lots of money. For all those different types of reasons, we tend to put these things off till later, till, till life is more stable, till we have either the finances or the time to put towards these important things. And often we keep putting them off and off and off. And so for every person, when they get to this point where they have a terminal illness, it's different, right? For some people, it was pursuing a hobby. For other people, it's writing a book. For some people, it's reconnecting with people that were important in their past that they let go of. For every person, it's different. But the common theme is it was something that was deeply important to them that they didn't pursue. You write in the book that money is not a goal that it's a tool, which is, by the way, something that we say on the show all the time, right? That's how we should think about money. It's a tool to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish in your life. But there's one story that you tell in the book. Um, it's the story of Liz. And I think it really exemplifies that. Can you talk a little bit about her? So Liz was a patient I actually met when she was unconscious. And the reason why was she, like so many people I actually encounter in the personal finance world, I started personal finance actually in the financial independence retire early um, community. And this idea of building up wealth, getting to a point where you don't have to work anymore, and then kind of quote unquote living the good life. Well, Liz was like a lot of us who started in this community, we become obsessed with money. This idea that Every life problem will be taken care of if we can just get to a certain net worth or make enough money that we can leave our tiresome jobs. Everything is going to be perfect. And what I've seen in this community and what I saw in Liz was when she actually got to the point where her finances were in order, she learned everything she needed to do, her investments were in order, she saw an end in sight. Instead of being incredibly excited or empowered by this, she actually started feeling depressed. Like, she didn't know what to do with her life now that this big thing that she thought was such an important goal was actually within reach. And because of it, she got really, really depressed. She started sleeping less. She started using alcohol in an unhealthy way. And by the time I met Liz for the first time, she had gotten into a car accident. They thought she had fallen asleep at the wheel. And I was sitting with her family as they had to decide whether to take her off life support, which they eventually did. And I remember sitting with her husband and, and 
you know, he was like, she was so concerned with our finances and leaving work and having enough. Like I would have worked the rest of my life if I could just have her back with me, even for another year. And it kind of drove home this idea that it leaves us a little empty when we make our goal pursuing wealth. Because while it sounds really good at the outset and it sounds really good at the beginning, it usually doesn't lead to real happiness because it's almost what I call a mirage. It looks very important and shiny, but when you actually get there, you start seeing through it and you see that there's nothing there. The wealth itself is not nearly as important as what that allows us to do. The problem is most of us have no clue what we really want to do with our lives, and that's where some of the depression comes in. Well, I think that I think that's true. I also think there's the risk that you achieve the initial goal that you set out for yourself as far as as a, a number is concerned and you get there and you decide that it's not enough and you just keep you just keep going. So, I guess it's a two-part question. Um how do you not do that, right? How do you not continue to strive for more if you are trying to hit a fire number and i'm i'm actually curious as to where you think the fire movement has gone recently after the pandemic and and it, because i think in in my perception it's definitely changed a bit but then how do you find these goals that give us purpose and give us meaning when we don't really know what makes us happy? That's about eight questions, so you can take them <laughs> at your leisure. Yeah, let me, I have so many different answers for those. So let's start with kind of the basic, and I want to double down on what you said. The problem with when you make money the goal is one of two things happen. When you get to that goal, you either find a sense of emptiness because you got to your goal and you don't know where, to go, know where to go next. So you pretty much double the goal, right? Everyone's like, oh, well, I was my goal was this net worth, but now it's going to be 2 million instead of 1 million, right? So that's part of the problem. And then you're just chasing again, but not really getting anywhere. The second problem is this idea of loss aversion. Often when people actually get to their goal, as opposed to being happy and excited, they're petrified that the stock market's going to change or they're going to one big expense away from not being at their goal anymore. And actually that causes more stress than not being at the goal in the first place. So it's really important to recognize the problem with just looking at money as the goal. So then your second question was, well, then how do you know what your goal should be? Or how do we approach this differently so that we don't get caught up on this idea of enough? And what I often tell people, which is very strange for a guy who has a personal finance podcast, one of the first things I tell people is take all those worries and concerns about money. And for a short period of time, let's put those aside. See, I think the money actually comes second. What comes first is trying to figure out your sense of purpose, identity, and connections. Once you have an idea what your sense of purpose is, then you can move back to building a financial framework that supports that. And to me, that's actually the real meaning of financial independence. It's not a number. It's this idea that I can figure out what makes me feel good and purposeful in life and pursue that and then use money to support that pursuit. For some people, that's going to be making lots of money so they don't have to work in a nine to five so that they can do what they want. For other people, it's actually building in their sense of purpose into their jobs so that they don't need as big of a number to start living the life they want to live. So I think if you can put your purpose identity connections first, start really thinking about that, and then bring in this idea of building a financial framework, which I think everybody should do, it can support us. I've read these mm. studies, right, on the difference between a job and a career and a calling. And and a purpose having a having a life with purpose at the center where that purpose is tied to work, it, it generally borders at least partially on on a calling. And a calling doesn't have to mean that you're saving the world, right? The, the, this research, or at least this body of research shows that they, they studied custodians in hospitals and found that the custodians who said they were taking care of their of, of patients, helping take care of patients rather than wa washing the floors and emptying the trash, the, the ones who felt this connection to the greater mission for them, it was a calling. And for the ones who are emptying the trash, it was not. So I, I mean, my, my question is, if you don't find purpose in what you're doing today, how can you find purpose in your current pursuit, if you don't want to switch, or switch to something 
that lights you up a little bit more? So I think there are a few answers to this question. One is, I think we get caught up on this, you know, capital P purpose. And sometimes I think we have to start thinking about the small P purpose, which means that probably for many of us, there are multiple purposes. Some are more important than others, and some will take up more of our time and some will take up less. So the bigger question is, well, how do we start figuring out what those things are so that we can live that life, whether economically or not, of purpose? I think there are a few ways to do this. This is where dealing with dying patients really helped me. So when we in hospice sit down with a dying patient, often we look at their symptoms, right? Control their nausea and their pain. We make sure they're in a safe environment and that their family's present, those kind of things. But then one of the next things we really talk about is the life review. This is a chance where we use a structured series of questions to help these patients look at their life and talk about what was important, what wasn't important, what mistakes they made, what successes they had. And it's really a chance for them to talk about their lives. The big question is, why don't we do this in healthy people every year? The idea of doing a structured life review helps us look at what we accomplished and didn't, what our biggest dreams and goals were, what we were always afraid to do but really wanted to. The easiest way to take a life review and bring it into one sentence, and I do this in the book, is I say, imagine that you're on your dying bed and you were just told you have a terminal illness. What do you always wish you had the energy, courage, or time to do, but you never pursued it? And I think that's like a big question. This is not something you answer today or tomorrow. This is really something you sit with. But by doing these type of exercises, by doing a life review, you start looking and saying, okay, what are those things that I dreamed about when I was a kid that everyone told me I couldn't do, right? What are those relationships that were important to me that really meant something that have fallen to the wayside? What are those hobbies, those things that I do that I feel most alive while doing, but I never seem to have enough time? What are those dreams that wake me up in the middle of the night and I'm so excited I can't go back to sleep because it's a big idea that I'm really passionate about? And by the time you wake up the next day, you've let it go because it was just a dream. It was just something in the middle of the night. None of this is perfect, but this is a beginning to start thinking about what are those things that really drive me? And if there were no rules, if I didn't have to worry about to make a living, if I didn't have to worry about what society would say about it, most people, when you really get down to it, have these deeper inner secrets, these things that are really, really important to them that often they've never had the courage to talk about. And there's lots of reasons why they don't have the courage to talk about it. One, like I said, is maybe it goes against some of what society expects of them or their family expects of them. My theory actually is these things deeply scare us because they remind us of our own mortality. When you really start pulling everything away and looking at what your real sense of purpose is, what you really feel like you were meant to do in the world, that's a really scary thing. We're afraid of failing. We're afraid of the deeper, harder work it's going to take to do that. So it's much easier to push it aside and say, I don't have time for that. I need to make a living. I need to build a net worth. I need to do whatever it is that you put in front of this thing. Um, I think we do that. And even if you still do all these things, if you practice the life review, if you ask yourself that question and meditate on it and still find nothing, that's when you go to the old tried and true throwing the spaghetti against the wall. That's when you start saying yes to things you normally say no to. You know, get yourself out there, volunteer, join groups, meet new people, put yourself in situations that might feel uncomfortable and see what sticks. And it doesn't have to be a perfect fit. The point is a lot of us are wandering this world either working ourselves to death or decompressing from work. And we're not spending any of our real valuable time doing those things that are important to us. If some of these exercises help you find something that feels a little more purposeful, even if it's not your life journey, but you can start filling some of that limited time you have with some of these more purposeful activities, I think you're in a better place than when you started. I, I think you're right. And I agree with you that these are very, very scary questions to ask. As you were reeling them off, I was sort of parsing them one by one and I could feel my heart start to beat a little faster because these are not questions that I ask myself on a regular basis but I think you're right I think um I think we should of course we still need money to make these things happen so we do need money to make all this stuff happen right we need money to 
deal with our goals of seeing the world, spending time with family, giving back, volunteering, or, or giving cash to causes that we, we believe in and we feel strongly about? How do we balance saving money with spending money so that we can enjoy life? So this is why I think figuring out your sense of purpose is important because in a sense, like I said, that comes first and then we can start building that financial life that supports that, right? So there's lots of ways to get to a point which is what I would call financial independence. And for me, again, financial independence is actually a life where your money supports doing things that are purposeful, that give you a sense of identity as much of the time as possible. There's lots of ways to go about that one way is to put off purpose and identity and say, I'm going to just work really hard for the next 10 years. It's something that makes me a lot of money. I'm going to save a lot. I'm going to invest a lot. I'm going to let that money work for me. And then after 10 years, I'm going to stop and do things that are purposeful. Another way is to do the exact opposite. Say, I'm going to find a job that feels so great, and this is what I want to do for a living. This fulfills my sense of purpose, and I'm going to make sure that job pays enough to support me over the next 20, 30, 40 years. I'll get the appropriate insurances, disability, life, all that kind of stuff to protect me. But otherwise, I'm going to tie my job and my purpose together. And then there's a bunch of different in-betweens. How you go about it's not important. What's important is that you can start bringing that sense of purpose, identity, and connections into your life, whether it's a plan for the future or to do it today, which leads me to that very important question you just asked. Well, so how do we know whether to spend today or save for tomorrow? And I think the way to answer that is to ask yourself another question. I think there's a dichotomy there, and each person has a different answer to this. And that important question is, are you afraid that you are going to die young and wealthy and never get to use that money to do the things you want? Or are you afraid that you're going to live to a ripe old age, run out of money, and die broke? If you can ask yourself that question, we then can look at the continuum between YOLO, you only live once, and deferred gratification, which is hyper-saving for retirement, and start making some real-life decisions that work for different people with different values. When I have this conversation, I love to talk about my father. My father, as I said at the beginning of the show, died when I was seven years old. He was 40. Now, interesting I'm so about my- so sorry. Yeah, and, and thank you. I, you know, I was so young at the time, but it's something I think about when I talk about these money conversations. He had this premonition he was going to die young. In fact, he told my mom when he married her, he said, I don't think I'm going to live long. So interestingly enough- that was top of his mind when he thought about money and how he used it. So, of course, again, he got life insurance and he did the things to protect us as a family. But he didn't save a huge amount of money for retirement. I mean, he was a photographer. He loved to travel. He had all sorts of passions. Like, this is a guy who pursued a lot of his purpose. In fact, when he got out of his fellowship, he was offered a very prestigious, high-paying job in a private practice in oncology and he walked away from it to work at the VA which paid a lot less but he liked it more because it gave him easier hours so that he could spend time with family and pursuing all these passions of his so if you're like my dad you're afraid that you're gonna die young and wealthy and you wanna make sure you can really enjoy that money so you probably don't save fifty percent of your extra money you probably save ten percent or five percent and then you probably spend the other forty forty five percent on YOLO and I think if you do this, if that's your big fear, one of two things happens. Either you're wrong and you live a long life, and it's true, you've been saving less for retirement, so it's going to take you a lot longer to retire. On the other hand, you've also been spending a lot today on doing those things you love. Maybe you've been taking extra vacation time. You've been pursuing your passions, using that money as a good tool. That's not a bad trade-off for retiring late because you're living a pretty good life today. If you are right and you do die young, then you used your money to support you and your passions. So that's one way of looking at it. Or you could be like me who thinks they're going to live a long time. I was afraid of dying broke, so I did the exact opposite. I saved about 40% of my income and then only spent 10% on YOLO. That way I was able to get to a high net worth much faster and could back off of work and really pursue passion for the rest of the time. When you are describing you, I, I, I feel like um, I feel like I'm somewhere in the middle, actually. I mean, I, I definitely have a fear of running out of money, which I know by the numbers I am not going to do. But in, you know, so it's somewhat of an irrational fear. But I, I think a lot of women have that, actually. I 
wanted to dig into the fire movement a little bit. You you came to your financial philosophy with um with a lot of fire principles, um, financial independence, retire early. Fire has morphed a little bit during the pandemic, as I was saying. Where where is fire now, and who do you think fire is is right for? So fire really has changed quite a bit, and it really has moved towards lifestyle design. So it used to be the people who originally were interested in fire, and this was especially in the early to mid, you know, 2005, 2010 area. This was really young professionals who made a lot of money who did not like work at all. And so the idea was grind your way to financial independence as fast as possible and then leave work. And I believe those were kind of the forebears of the FIRE movement today, which is much different. There are these concepts of slow FI and coast FI, and we can go into what those are. But the concepts are, instead of waiting five or ten years to live your best life, let's incorporate this idea of living the lives we want now and using our knowledge to reach actual, quote-unquote, financial independence later, right? So maybe I can reach financial independence in ten years by working full-time at a job I don't like and saving all my money, or maybe I can work part-time in that job, and it might take me five or ten extra years to get to financial independence, but in the meantime, I get to spend half my day doing what I like to do today. And so it's really changed in the sense that we're looking at lifestyle, and we're trying to change from this whole very deferred gratification ideology or, or aspect of it, and move much more towards kind of having your cake and eating it too. How can we be smart about our money so that we can enjoy today, but also protect ourselves for tomorrow? We started this conversation talking about regrets and talking about what you hear from from your patients in hospice about what they regret doing with their money, not doing with their money. And you said people don't regret not having more or not working for more. We just um, lost a member of our extended family in his 90s, and he regretted it every day um, and talked about it every day. And the reason that he regretted it was that he was worried about not leaving enough for his wife and his children. I, I wonder where that fits into this, wanting to do more for the people that you leave behind and what you're hearing about the amount of support that we're giving our adult kids, our grandkids, knowing that they are coming into the working world at a very difficult time, many of them. So. What I normally see, the few times I see people really concentrate on money, it's not usually the money itself. It's, again, what money could have been used as a tool to do. So when someone says on their deathbed, I wish I had made more money, what they're really saying is, I wish I had created a legacy that was very supportive for you so that I knew for sure you would be okay. And so, yes, money does help as a tool to do those things, but it's it's more an expression of love towards those left behind, I believe, than a concern for the money itself. And so there are ways around that too if you know that that's going to be important to you, whether that be different types of insurance policies or different types of financial planning. That's something we can also, again, build into our thought process at a younger time especially where we can start easing that transition if that's something we're really afraid of. Um, I think it's difficult. As you said, these are different and difficult times, and this likelihood that our kids or grandkids may not do as well as we have um, is frightening. Uh, on the other hand, when you start looking at money to see for what it really is, which again is something to support us, but it's not what true happiness is made of, I still believe that we can start concentrating on ways to A, help us and our family members have enough money, um, but that 
doesn't end up being the central push of our lives, right? So that we can use what we have available to us. We can use the power of compounding in the stock market. We can use our wonderful power of earnings and savings. We always talk about money as a tool, but we have to remind people that it's one of many tools. Like we have our communities and our skills. For young people, they have their energy and their free time. For older people, they have their experience and knowledge. And I think especially for those people who are really getting to the end of life and saying, boy, I really wish I provided more money, it's also a good time to start saying, yeah, but let's look at those other tools that you've provided and how your legacy rounded out totally, not just in that how much money did you leave, but what important knowledge and relationships and love did you leave behind? Because that also nourishes people. And I think that's something to also remind people as they get to this point, that those other things they left will sustain us also as well as money. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth in that. As we start to wrap this up, I'm, I imagine that you have a ton of experience also in the area around estate planning. And I'm wondering what big conversations or questions are people not having that they really should be having? What are the things that you hear that people regret not talking about? The biggest regret, the biggest problem is we don't talk about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> Our biggest issue actually is that these conversations especially between people of our age group and their adult parents who are getting older and having medical problems, et cetera, is that we tend not to have these conversations at all. And in the book, Taking Stock, I talk about a few conversation beginners to help people start having these conversations with their parents about money, because it's really hard to go up to your parent and say, so, you know, what's your money situation and what do you want us to do with that? That often feels threatening, difficult, and painful. In the book, I suggest a few different techniques. For instance, it's a wonderful time as you are becoming an adult to ask your adult parents for advice. Like, I'm looking at my own estate plan. I'm meeting with an attorney. What did you do? Even if you don't actually need their input, it's a great way to start the conversation and have them to start talking about what they've done because they feel like they're helping you, so it's much less threatening. The other way is to bring out examples. Like I have an example in the book where a young man, his mother had Alzheimer's, and his dad had done all the right paperwork, the financial power of attorney, the durable health power of attorney, all this great stuff. But then the dad got COVID, ended up on a ventilator, and the dad hadn't given the son financial power of attorney in case something happened to the dad. So the dad was on the ventilator. The mom had Alzheimer's and couldn't make any decisions. The mom needed financial support. The money was there, but the child couldn't access this. Those kind of stories are the kind of stories we can also bring up and say, you know, remember my, my friend John? He went through this horrible thing with his parents. Boy, I hope that doesn't happen to us. So that's kind of a nice way to bring up the conversation. And lastly... I think we need to remind our parents when we have these conversations, what we're really talking about is legacy. So it's not just money, it's stories. It's how do you want us to continue to remember you years after you're gone? And so if you have this conversation about legacy, the money eventually comes into it. But what you're really talking about is their life stories and their relationships and the things they taught us. Um, and I think if we can go from there, we start making this conversation a lot easier. Now, when we're talking about our own security, we all need to look at an estate plan, and this encompasses both medical legal documents as well as legal and financial documents. I talk about it in the book, but we got to start looking at both of those things, and we got to be unafraid to look at them now as opposed to putting it off, which it, again, is so easy to do because this is uncomfortable stuff. Uh, but if we want to have a an end of life for ourselves that feels like dignity, but also provide that dignity to our families that they're given the appropriate time to mourn for us as opposed to scrambling to figure out our estate and our money, which happens to a lot of people. Um, part of having a dignified life and leaving a good legacy is trying to put these documents in place to help whoever's left after we go. A hundred percent. Jordan, I know you've got a great podcast. Where can our listeners find it and where else can they find more about you? So the easiest place to engage me and all the ways I create content is jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. There you will see links 
to the three ways I kind of create content. One is a medical blog, which I no longer write at, but I did from like 2005 to about 2018. The link is there. There's also a financial blog called diversify.com. And last but not least, the Earn and Invest podcast, where I spend most of my time today creating uh, new content, as well as links to the book, Taking Stock. Amazing. Thank you for being here. This was a pleasure. Thank you so much for this great conversation. <laughs>